we, we've switched times around just a little bit so that we can hear Meg's talk for us and you, there will be plenty of time for questions and answers and then we shall eat and then you can chitter chat and what have you but I know there are people who have to be making plain strains and what have you so we're just going to up the time a little so after Mag talks then we will eat and I know her name is Margaret <laughs> really we lovingly call her Mag who is president of the leading age of Connecticut and she's been in that position since 2001. As president, she leads this statewide association representing not-for-profit and mission-driven driven items for older adults, including nine not-for-profit CCRCs in the state. And we do know that there are, that we've told there are 16 here within the state, or is it 70? What's the name? I'll get it from you later. But we, yeah, there is a new one, and we, we're not clear on what that, type, what that is. Anyway, Leading Age Connecticut members are dedicated to expanding the world of possibility for aging. And I keep insisting, everybody says, oh, you're old. No. I said, no, we are all aging. From the minute we were born until we check out, we are aging. And so that's the, the services that are provided by Mag's group is for, a, for people who are aging. Mag previously held positions of Director of Government Relations in Connecticut State Medical Society and has also held positions with the Travelers and the Connecticut Department of Income Maintenance. She is so knowledgeable. She is such a good friend to us all in CCRCs in Connecticut. And it's my great honor and delight to present to you Mag Morelli. Um, well, thank you everyone and welcome to Connecticut. I know you've probably heard that a few times and if I told you abs how absolutely beautiful it was out there today, you'd all be leaving. So I'm not going to tell you until I'm over. But uh, it is a wonderful day and I know that I'm the um, pre-luncheon speaker, which is always kind of a tough spot. But I want to give you a little presentation of how we're working with the, NAC, the CCRC group, uh, Concord, here in Connecticut. And then I'll stay here for as long as you have questions, but I don't want to keep you from lunch. So we'll work with it that way. <laughs> As Ruth said, um, I work for Leading Age Connecticut, which is one of the state affiliates of Leading Age National, and I think you're all aware of Leading Age National. And we represent the nonprofit CCRCs in the state of Connecticut. Do you not represent the profit ones also? No, we do not represent the for profit ones, but I'll tell you a little bit how we've brought the for profit ones in. Because we've sort of had this evolving relationship with uh, the Concord Group here in Connecticut. And it all began in 2005 with a common enemy the nursing home provider tax. And if any of you have had your seat home provider tax or have been threatened by one in your state, um, you know it's a particular threat to the CCRCs, um, particularly type A CCRCs, because it's a tax on every nursing home bed that go, the state collects, sends, it's kind of a little bit of a scheme, sends to the state, of, to the federal government who matches it for Medicaid funding, and it comes back, and it's a way to get more Medicaid funding into your state to pay for Medicaid nursing home beds and, and Connecticut's case, other Medicaid services. Um, but if you're in a CCRC and you're not, I'm never going to be on Medicaid, you're just paying the tax and you're never getting any of the benefit back. So when we had um, our proposed pro uh, provider tax, which did eventually pass in Connecticut, the CCRC residents organized um, in hopes to get an exemption from the provider tax if it were passed. So we joined forces with the CCRC groups and uh, worked for that exemption, Leading Age National helping us on the technical side of what we needed to do, and we were very successful. It was a, and it was sort of the beginning of a wonderful relationship, I like to say. Bob Nagel was sort of at the head of that fight over there when he was at Edge Hill, and Edge Hill at the time was a member of Leading Age Connecticut, and um, we really, it was, we were a force to be reckoned with. And the other interesting piece of this is, it was a way to educate legislators as to what a CCRC was, because they had no idea what this wonderful um, uh, organization, or, or these organizations were in the state, um, that they actually were allowing to, to sort of flourish. So after we passed the exemption and we started to move forward, and we had the leading HCCRC group working, and then we had the resident, you know, the provider end, and we had the residents over here um, working on various issues. We, 
No, we, we just keep oh, okay. <laughs> we had a, a joint meeting of the two groups, some representative groups of both meetings, and we actually facilitated the meeting uh, with Billy Albin, who's a member of the Concord group, who is a professional um, organizer and administrator and, and uh, meeting manager. And she did a little exercise with us where we wore each other's, she said, we are going to put ourselves in each other's shoes, or moccasins, I think, as she called it at the time. And we're going to answer a series of questions, and then we're going to compare the results. So all of the management became residents, and all the residents became management. We talked about various issues, such as, you know, what are your priorities for this community, and where do you want to see this community going, and what are your concerns about the community? And then we compared the results, and 95% of our answers were all the same. And we realized that we really had a lot in common um, as far as what our concerns were, what, our, what we wanted to see, and how we wanted the CCCRC or uh, community to succeed. So from then on, we sort of had this joint, we've been working on various joint projects. Uh, the first being uh, the Connecticut Consumer Guide. Our laws in Connecticut were written several, many years ago, when CCRCs were just beginning. And it was a new industry in the state, and they're really built on a model of disclosure. The state views the CCRC entrance fee as an investment, and they feel that there needs to be strong transparency and disclosure to someone who's making that investment. What the Comper Group realized were that many residents were moving in and not doing their due diligence prior to moving in, so not understanding the investment that they were making. And they really had this drive to develop a guide for people who were considering uh, moving to a CCRC. It was both a promotional piece to show how wonderful the lifestyle can be, but also a very plain consumer a consumer guide, you know, plainly written consumer guide as to what you need to ask about before you move in. So we helped, and we you know we gathered material and helped to, um, the CCRC group, uh, the, the resident group, develop this. Um, consumer guide. It's really, it's really resident driven, the drafting of this, and we've been helping to disseminate it and provide it. Many of our marketing departments actually provide it to prospective residents. We have it on our website. We're trying to right now to develop a sort of a CCRC consumer guide section of our website that where people can go to when they're considering coming into the CCRC, to a CCRC. And it's just a spectacular document. It was really a collaborative effort that, uh, but spearheaded by the, the resident group. So then we started talking, okay, so now we get our consumer guide out for people who are really looking for the investment. And then we had started talking about other issues that people had concerns about, and whether we needed to change the state statutes. Because um, I said, as I said, our statutes were written several years ago, really focused on disclosure, um, and sort of taken for granted, I think, in the state a little bit. Sort of they were there, and people were filing their disclosure statements, and. You know, we had a few bumps in the road for the few places, and I have to say the state has always come to the, um, to the side of the residents whenever there's been an issue. But, you know, nobody's tweaked that statute in a long time. So when we looked at the statute, we realized that in the statute there was what's called an advisory committee. And that advisory committee that was supposed to advise, right now in Connecticut our CCRCs are, are regulated by the Department of Social Services, which many, many years ago was called income maintenance, so you can say I dated myself in my own bio. But um, the Department of Social Services, which also runs Medicaid, which runs food stamps, which runs a lot of programs, uh, uh, the welfare programs for the state, is also oversees the CCRC industry. And they are supposed to have an advisory committee, which is supposed to include professionals, accountants, actuaries, insurance representatives, representatives of CCRCs, um, and residents, people who are familiar with the model. And um, they're supposed to review uh, uh, the functions of the CCRC, report to the commissioner, and have a sort of a, a direct line to the commissioner and the regulatory um, group that oversees it. What we realized is that the advisory committee had been disbanded years and years ago and had never and was not, had not appointed a meeting, meeting. So we had our next project, which was to get this committee reinstated. And um, one of the uh, Concra um, representatives from down in uh, Meadow Ridge, which is down in the Fairfield County, had um, Dan Robinson. He had a friend who was the state representative, John Shaven, and they worked together to put some pressure along, along with leading age in our lobbying group and the Concra leadership to put some pressure 
And I have to tell you, we didn't have to put much pressure onto the Department of Social Services to reinstate this committee. What we did have to do is say, don't worry, we'll do all the legwork. Because <laughs> they were, at the time, very overwhelmed. We had just had a, you know, a major food stamp fraud issue, and they were you know, moving their computers from a cobalt-based system to you know, a brand new um, IT system. And so they were a little overwhelmed over at um, Social Services. But we said, we'll do the legwork for you if you, allow, if you will reinstate this committee. So um, our next victory was we did get the committee reinstated. This is the uh, new appointees, which is a combination. We have someone from healthcare, we have two residents, one from the for-profit, one from the nonprofit. We have two management, um, CCRC management positions, one from the for-profit, one from the not-for-profit. We have an attorney. Um, it happens to be leading ages, Connecticut's legal counsel, but she also represents CCRC's both nonprofit and for-profit. We have actuaries. We have accountants. Um, it is a very, very uh, healthcare, as I said, and members of the Department of Social Services. A nice, diverse group of, of experts, residents, management um, that has a direct line now to our regulatory body. I think some of the, it, it's been a great forum for discussion. Uh, we've been able to dispel some myths and, and understand some, some truths that are going on in the state, how the state is actually monitoring us, regulating us. We've been able to inform the state as to how we feel they really should be looking at us. Um, we've been able to address some ideas and opportunities, and we've opened it up. It's, it, the meetings are open to the public, and we've invited all residents, uh, management to come, and we at various times we had various people come to the meetings. We meet quarterly. Um, and. I think the first several meetings was just a way for us to really position our, not position ourselves, but to get comfortable with where we were, who we were, get the state to understand where we're coming from. There's a little, there's a, I have to admit, there's a little tension there with the state um, from the perspective of not feeling that they may be um, involved enough with what our, the CCRCs are doing. Um, we've had a review of our laws. One of the questions where, you know, we were just talking about model state laws. One of the problems that we've, we've seen around the country is that it would have been fabulous to have a, everybody start with a model law, but everybody started with different laws. So now you have to take these new ideas and say, how does, how do, how does that fit into our law that we have and the way that our CCRCs are currently set up? Um, so we had a great presentation, um, Maureen Weaver, our attorney, took the Massachusetts residence rights laws, which they had just passed, and said, okay, how does that fit into our law? What laws, what rights do we already have here in Connecticut? Because the way our law is written, there's not a section that says residence rights, but they're kind of spattered throughout the statute, and you need to be a, an attorney from Wigan and Dana to, to understand it. So she was able to put it out for us and get us to understand what we had already and what we might be missing and what we might be looking at. Um, and. Our latest project is that we are working with. Um, we've asked, you know, we've asked individual CCRCs, and I, and this was our philosophy in doing this. We asked individual CCRCs who have particular problems with their communities to work through the Conquer Group to bring their issues to the Conquer Group and have if Conquer felt that these were, you know, widespread or potentially widespread or um, common issues to bring that to the advisory committee. Our feeling was then the advisory committee could deal with them as issues coming from concrete, and they weren't identified with a particular community, or weren't taint, didn't, when we didn't want to taint a particular community, or to inhibit someone from bringing someone thing to concrete that then comes to this advisory committee that we could deal with. Say they have an issue they really don't want to talk to their, um, bring up amongst the others in their um, community then the advisory committee can deal with it as an issue coming from CONCRA because all our meetings are open to the public. All our minutes are open. It's a government committee. So it has to be very transparent. So we feel like this is actually a better way to deal with some of the issues and, and actually making it more open. So we're dealing with three issues that came to us from CONCRA. And what we decided to do, we had a very good open discussion about it at the last advisory committee meeting. We decided to, to, to um, spin off a little task force to deal in deeper. Um, as I said, our laws really are based on disclosure, but the, but the industry's matured quite a bit, and issues have come up over the last 20, 30 years that maybe were anticipated when this law was put together. And right now, there is a concern from the residents' perspective that, you know, just what are their rights, or where do they stand when it comes to a potential bankruptcy, 
We do have receivership in the state, which is similar to, I think, the model you, law you were talking about, where the state would come in and, and uh, take over the governance for a while. But if it's a, if it's a receivership or a bankruptcy or a sale, and I think the sale is something that really has people concerned within the state, particularly from a nonprofit to a for-profit. So we're actually looking at other states' laws and seeing what can we put in place that would be applicable to um, all of the communities, all the, the resident groups in all the communities that might be helpful to them and make them have a feeling of um, that they do have some rights or securities, um, way of dealing with things, or at least being made aware of issues so that they can take action if they need to moving forward. So we're in the midst of that right now. So I think we've evolved from a group that started out on a legislative issue that affected us all. We realized we really have all these common goals. We probably better working together than just trying to just see what each other are working on apart. Really getting together to get this advisory group together, developing this wonderful forum where we can work on things and have a direct contact to the regulators. And now we're taking it that next step to see, okay, are there other pieces of the statute that we may want to change? And really doing it as together, similar to what happened in Massachusetts, I believe, where there was a collaborative effort to move forward and work with the regulators to make it a better statute for everybody. And so we've developed, you know, within this advisory group, outside of that, there's a very good, I think, a great relationship between uh, the Concord Group and Leading Age Connecticut. You know, we've been building on our common concerns. We can share our expertise. As I said, you know, we have some great legal and accounting and actuarial expertise that we can bring in to really explain it to both sides uh, of what the issues are. We're hopefully creating an environment of mutual understanding. We're not always going to agree, but not each CCRC agrees with each other. I mean, there's always, you know, we understand that. Where there's always, I work in, I'm a, I'm a lobbyist, so I understand you're never going to agree on everything. But you look for the common ground and what's going to make the most sense for everybody. And I, you know, we really want a strong CCRC community industry field here in Connecticut. And that means that both all residents and prospective residents and, um, and management need to feel that they're comfortable and can move forward mm -hmm. and really progress, you know, expanding the possibilities, as we say. And then we have this CCR advi CCRC advisory committee that is a great tool for us to use to do that, particularly when it comes to legislation. So that's where we are in the state. And I just wanted to leave, uh, sort of end my formal presentation with a couple of slides about the relationship with national leading age and the CCRC uh, field. Because they've just, I, and I don't know, did someone talk about this earlier this weekend? Mm -hmm. But the leading age is running the CCRC name store. And um, it's really, it's, it's, an, it's an idea where leading age is looking to sort of rename the term continuing care retirement community was something that resonates with the next generation. <coughs> it all started with Mathers Lifeways um, did some consumer research that showed that the, that the term CCRC or continuing care retirement community just was not resonating with newer consumers. So based on this research, which was um, a little, I think, alarming to some people because I don't, I don't think they had really thought about it earlier or, t you know, just kind of, you know, always use this word similar to like when you use, you know, many, many words in, in, in this field. Um, so they spearhead, they're spearheading uh, an industry-wide renaming project called the CCRC Name Store. The rules about the criteria are it must be consumer-centric, you know, based on, on residents and consumers. It has to expand the possibilities of aging, know they, knowing that CCRCs are evolving and new models of CCRCs and are being created. Um, it has to be available to own. That means somebody else can't have copyrighted it. Um, it's got to be memorable and easy to say, and it must be brand compatible. And that means uh, compatible to the current CCRC communities that are out there already. So I just wanted to put that out there because I thought that uh, I, I think some there. See, Leading Age is going to go out into the field and uh, hold regional sort of brainstorming sessions. So you'll probably, you might see them in one of your communities or in your state or in your area um, talking about it. And I thought, you know, it might, it, there might be some ideas right here. You can start brainstorming right now about, about, the, about the different name. I just thought it was a very interesting project and a very interesting concept because when they mentioned it, I don't know, I have never thought of changing the word, the, the term CCRC before. Um, but this was very compelling and interesting. So I thought you might, you thought you might enjoy it. 
So now, after telling you about our sort of evolution of the Connecticut model here and working, and I have to, you know, I just want to say one thing before I open it up to questions. This has been a great working relationship, and I think we've drawn on the expertise of both our leading age professionals and the expertise uh, within the Conquer Group, the professional uh, lives of, of the residents in the Conquer Group together have combined to create this very, very strong working relationship. But it's also, for at least for me personally, been a great personal relationship between the two groups, and um, I find it extremely rewarding to work with the resident group, and I thank you so much for having me here today um, to sort of further this dialogue. I think it's a natural dialogue to have, um, and it has just been, for me professionally, a wonderful, a wonderful uh, opportunity. So, thank you. The uh, question is this, uh, we need to uh, clone you and drop you in the majority of the states in the USA where there are no NACO members and no resident organization. And in those states, there is a leading aid organization. What is your advice to us in how to build bridges in that run zone where there is no resident activity and only a leading age organization? That's a good question. Um, if I were to look at, us, at, at the Connecticut model, uh, or the Connecticut leading age, we have always had a CCRC chapter of the management within our group, you know, like a council, a, a committee that meets. If we had no conquer group and someone came to me and said, how can we get the residents involved, what I might consider is having that CCRC group work with their residents to develop a separate residence group. So I think the nonprofit CCRC members of leading age in your state could ask their CCRCs to seek the resident, I'm sure they probably all have resident associations within their CCRCs, to get a representative and they maybe, maybe can convene the residents group. Sometimes you just need someone to send the email, get the meeting place, set the time. They could do the administrative function and the resident group could be autonomous to leading age, but facilitated by the leading age. That's one idea that I might, and I, if you want, I can take that idea back to my state exec group and ask them what they feel if they don't have a resident group, how they feel they might be able to facilitate, mm -hmm. and then I can get back to you. Does that make sense? Please, I'll give you my name, address, phone number. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> that sounds great. On that line, in Virginia, we have a fabulous relationship with New Age, with Lady Age. Uh, but the relationship with the management group in Virginia is pretty tough and there are lots of people in Van Hoff, the management group, who are very anti fact of the President's Association. So, and I'm assuming that we might well face that in a number of other states. How would you try to address that kind of issue? Yeah, that is, that's a tough one. And you know, one of the things we find, that's why this advisory group is good. We made a conscious effort to make sure we were representing for-profit and not-profit to bring together in this advisory group. Um, and I don't know if there's a similar legislative committee in your state, um, but it's tough because a lot of the solutions you come up with too, like we can come up with great solutions at leading age, but they don't really apply to the for-profit model. And things that maybe apply in the for-profit model, you can't bring over to the non-profit model, so you need to find some flexible solutions and ideas that fit both models. Um, there may be a, you know, I, I, that's a tough question. One of the ways we've done in Connecticut that, is that I, as Leading Age Connecticut, have reached out to some, we don't actually have a formal for-profit association, but we have some, for instance, Life Care Services represents several, um, or manages several, different uh, for-profit CCRCs in the state, so reaching out to life care services and, and sort of the uh, management. We also had, what was very interesting is Dan Robinson, who was, I showed you a picture of him earlier, he um, is a resident at Meadow Ridge, which is owned by David Reese, who owns um, or has started several CCRCs in the state of Connecticut, he's, and I think he's in other states also. Dan actually organized a meeting of CONCRA at his facility where David Reese addressed the group, and I thought that was a that was a 
a really sort of unique way to bring Mr. Reese into the conversation and to sort of start to bridge that gap. So it may be an idea where if you have a strong um, resident association member in a for-profit with maybe a strong chain or owner in the state, to ask, have a meeting at that community and ask the owner to come and address. Because what David Reese did at that meeting was he explained his perspective as an individual owner, as a for-profit owner who starting CCRCs. And he's a very, um, he's been very successful and people are, um, he has really wonderful communities in the state. But he gave his perspective, which I think is what a lot of these, you know, when we have meetings, when we have this advisory committee, when we talk about things, it's, it's understanding each other's perspectives. And I think that was extremely helpful, both from the perspective of David Reese, understanding where the NACRA group, or the CONCRA group was coming from, but also for CONCRA, to really get some understanding of what the nonprofit model. So that may be a way to start, is if you have someone who's got a strong relationship with their owner to bring them in. <coughs> In the conversation about um, modern laws, someone raised the, the problem of uh, leading age maybe objecting to the progress of, of promoting standards, such as the ones that you saw enumerated earlier. Do you have an answer for how we can move forward standardization of operations of CCRCs with the support of leading age? Sure. Um, well, I'd have to, you know, I'd have to talk about why leading age would object to it. I, I think what I allude, uh, sort of alluded to earlier when we were talking about taking a model law and applying it to your state law, because these laws have already been in existence for many, many years in many states, it's hard to replace a law with another law. You, you know, each state is kind of different and unique in their characteristics as far as how the CCRC is developed, what the financial report reporting requirements are, what the reserve requirements are, and so you have existing entities and states and sort of existing models of governance. So I know, for instance, when I worked for the AMA, and it was very similar with the Medical Practice Act. You had, every state has their own different Medical Practice Act, has their own different you know, laws regarding other practice acts. What the AMA had done was develop model state laws. So you didn't have a national law that regulated it, but they had some model state laws that were based on certain principles. So you could use that, um, they were flexible enough so you could adapt it to your state. So for instance, we now are looking for, well, how, do, how are consumers going to feel secure and protected if they know that there's a sale that's going to happen in the state of Connecticut with the current laws we have? And so we're looking at all the other state laws right now to say, okay, what do other people put in for protections? And if there were a set of model state laws that you know, that leading age and, and NACRA had sort of agreed on, we could look to that and say, how could I adapt that law to my law in the state? So maybe it's a series of model laws that people can adapt their states to, but I'm not sure what where leading age, why leading age is objecting to it, unless they're objecting to it. I'm thinking, are they objecting to a national law? No, just model laws? I have not heard that, but I will check into that. I think you're going to hand up first before then. I'm the uh, president of the Massachusetts organization. So you mentioned our state several times. I think that uh, the leading age Massachusetts represent for profit and non profit CCRCs. The organization doesn't, but I think in that negotiation for your law, they did. Are there for profit? I, I, I've sat with a group from leading age, and there were for profit people oh, there, okay. as I understood it. Am I wrong? That's right. They, they're, they're, on a, they're invited to participate in that particular committee, but the organization uh, itself is to represent the nonprofits that right. you are. Okay. Okay. And when it came to the new law that we passed about a year and a half ago, the leading age cooperated, but they made it very clear that if there were any teeth in the law, they would not support it. And it was clear that we wouldn't pass a law without their support, at least not for a very long time. And so we went with no teeth. So we have two laws, but there's no punishment. The state organization, that it, the state agency that's supposed to collect all the information, 
is incompetent at best. <laughs> they don't remind the facility, the, the managements that, that they're supposed to turn things in. They don't keep the files straight. Uh, we're just doing a review now, and we've looked at more than half of the folders at the State House, and half of those are incomplete. You know, if I, if I, you didn't tell me you're from Massachusetts, I would have thought you were from Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the very, one of the big issues that um, the Conquer Group had with our Department of Social Services is that, you know, they're collecting these disclosure statements and they're being put in a box. So that was actually one of the first things we tackled. That's why we went to this advisory group and sort of trying to get the Department of Social Services and, you know, you could see they were, you know, the commissioner sat down with us and he said to us, I understand what you're saying, but you have to understand I have literally millions of people over here I'm trying to feed every day. And, you know, we were in the midst of this, you know, huge scandal and we're trying to, like, so we understood that, which is why we said, you would put this committee together and oversee it. We'll do all the paperwork. We'll do the noticing. We'll post it. We have better food anyway, so we, you know, so we do it. So which is one th one way you can sort of get to that is sort of help your state agency work on it. Second thing is we've come up with some ideas. So all of the CC, you may not know this, but all the Connecticut CCRCs received a notice last week from the state. They are now to file electronically, as opposed to paper. And begin. We have talked to the state about okay, once you can get this electronically, we will post it. We'll F F O I it. We'll post it on our website, so now it'll be easily accessible to the consumers to be able to see the disclosure statements, to see the comparison, something that was very difficult before. Now we'll be able to, I now don't everybody run to my website because nobody submitted them yet, but um, we'll be able to put them up and make it much more accessible. So sort of working with the law, and I, you know, this happens a lot. You get this law passed, but you can't just pass a law. You have to work it. Then. And it's hard. It's difficult. Um, this is happening, you know, so for instance, like with managed care laws and things like that. You get these rights and protections passed, but you really have to watch over them. You have to work on them. And um, so that's what we're trying to do, because we don't have much teeth in our law either. We really don't. Um, but you can use what you have to try to make it a better law and to make it, and make it better. And that's, that's right what we're trying to do right now, work within our law to make things better and make it more accessible. Uh, I think I can point it to you next, and then I'll come over to you, and then you have one, two, three. Uh, I'm wondering when the first CCRC was opened in and when your most recent opening. Okay, Joe was, I think it was Doncaster, right? It was our very first one. So when was that? In the 80s? Yes. Early 80s, it was Doncaster. The latest one is up the street in Groton. Um, it's the Fairview Odd Fellows Home. Right now, it's right now it's um, housing with uh, a nursing home, and uh, they're building a CCRC cottages. Yes, uh, it's either 17 or 18 because now McLean also, which was also a nursing home with housing, has become a CCRC, and that's up in Simsbury. That was last maybe 18 months ago. They be officially became a CCRC, and then we have three organizations that are doing a CCRC at home model. Sim Seabury being one of them, sort of adding it to their traditional CCRC, and then we have a group, uh, Central Connecticut Senior Services, which is starting it, has not actually started se selling it, but the Fairfield Senior Services, which just used to be the Fairfield Jewish Home, um, or Fairfield Jewish Senior Services. Senior Services. Oh, Fairfield. Yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, they're, they're in the they've actually started selling their membership, so we have those CCRC at home that model. We Seabury needed to go forward and get some legislative changes maybe five years ago to start that. Again, evolving the statute, changing with the market. I must do next. Uh, I was I'm from Massachusetts and I've been associated with the state organization for fifteen years and I served six years on the on the board of NAPA. And all I always heard from National Mass Agent was the cooperation between providers and residents. But in Massachusetts, I did not feel that that was the same organization. So I'm very interested <coughs> as to how you started your advisory council with the two organizations meeting together. When, when you look up on the screen. Right. Uh, 
Are this one? Meetings are open to the public and you, you all run whatever comes up in the way of a discussion. Because I think this would be very helpful for the uh, uh, CCRCs and the other uh, community care organizations to deal with mass aging because uh, I don't think they cooperate with us to the same extent that national cooperates with NAC. Well, I, you know, we, I guess it's either lucky or unlucky, but we had a state law already in existence that had created this advisory committee. So we started actually meeting, um, and, and it really was, I would have to say, in, um, driven by personality. There were, you know, because Bob Nagel, who you're sitting next to, um, came to us, and we started working on this provider text together, we developed a personal relationship. Then Bob, at the time, was heading up the Concord group, or involved in the leadership of Concord, and started saying, really, we need Concord to start meeting with Leading Age. We were CAMPA at the time. And we started meeting together. So we had we developed a relationship, and really it was almost personality-driven, uh, driven by individuals, similar to what I was saying with the David Reese issue, to really start, and we started meeting, and then we had our wearing each other's moccasins meeting, which I thought was great and, and facilitated by one of the residents. Um, and a common understanding started to me and then realized that we had this advisory committee and statute that we could sort of resurrect and reinstitute. Now we meet, I would say there's two relationships going on here. There's the advisory committee that's official and meets quarterly and we take the minutes and we post the minutes and the Secretary of State you know, notices people. We've been holding them at Masonic Care and Wallingford and people have been coming and really as a way to bring official and formal complaints and ideas to, re, to, to come up with solutions to bring to the state. But we still have this sort of informal relationship between CONCRA and Leading Age Connecticut that has become um, a very good working as well as personal relationship. So I would approach Alyssa Sherman, and who's the head, who's my colleague in, Mass, in Massachusetts, and maybe ask for a meeting between the two groups. Because I'm sure. Are two months, but it's only four of them, four of us. So it's four of a smaller group. The other thing that we do that I think has been extremely helpful is that Congress invites me to come and address their semi annual meeting. And I come and give a little legislative update so they know what's going on because a lot of the things we're dealing with at the Capitol will affect you. Mm -hmm. They're dealing with nursing homes, assisted living rules, and you know, housing um, um, laws. So I give a legislative update, they feed back what they're concerned with so that I can bring it to my group and we can work on it in our lobbying efforts. So that might be another idea is to bring Alyssa to your group. Um, I say Alyssa, Alyssa Sherman is the CEO of Leading Age Massachusetts. And I think that works really well because it, it, it really opens up the communication between the two. Who um, initiates yeah, both sides. It's been sort of an ongoing, open, you know, I, unfortunately I can't come to their next meeting, but um, because be right here. I know, and I can, maybe I'll have to change my schedule. <laughs> I think you're next. Okay. Well, I think you're a conciliator, and that's a, a wonderful thing to have. And uh, uh, our situation, uh, by the way, in California, we have a law like that, but the governor disbanded the committee. We did have a working committee. Uh, the governor disbanded, but uh, California is a little unique in that Leading Age California is the state association member of NACRA. And okay. so uh, they changed their bylaws so that all residents are uh, members of Leading Age California. And I'm on the board, and, uh, and I'm hoping to share your talk today with Joanne Handy because I know that she'll uh, be very interested in this because we, the resident, the California local resident group is, has been uh, antagonistic at best and is out of, uh, out of communion, to use a church term, with NACRA uh, and is also uh, has difficulty with leading age California. So that would be a good thing. But I, um, uh, I wanted to mention a couple of things. First, the model laws are state laws. The proposal is to work through the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. We did take this proposal first to Leading Age National. We met with Steve Mogg in Washington on May 18th, 
2010, four years ago, and uh, to try to get a, a joint effort going, that never occurred. And I asked him after a lapse of three years when we were repeatedly, Jack Matheson was trying, who was our president at that time, tried very hard to get this going, working with Larry Minix. And Steve said that the reason is that our model laws are focused mainly on financial and contract matters, and there is no leading age national committee, provider committee, for financial and contractual matters, so there was nobody for us to meet with. So uh, that meant that they, uh, they weren't able to, to move forward or, or have a position. Um, you mentioned this name storming thing with the CCRC name, and one of the things that interested me and in what you put up there was this term consumers. And I know Leading Age uh, National has a consumer cabinet which has no residence on it, and they have a, no residence on their, their board, although they have involved uh, three residents on their governance task force, which is a very beneficial thing. But I'm uh, excuse me, Bob, uh, but I'm curious, uh, do you view residents as consumers or as participants in their organizations? I thought Leading Age had a, a resident on their board. Pardon? I thought Leading Age had a resident on their board. No, Larry Minix told me last week that they have none currently. Oh, none currently, okay. But they have had a resident on their board. They, have uh, they had a resident non who was a retired executive, CTRC executive. Oh, okay. I'll check into that. Um, I think from this perspective, when you're talking about naming, and you're talking about a market, then you are talking about consumers. I think they, well, when they say consumers, because they're, they're trying to look at the field of aging services as not as patients and not as residents, not as older adults, but consumers. And it's a broad-based consumer market. It's adult children. It's actual residents. It's um, people who are uh, moving into independent housing. Um, so I think they use the word consumer as sort of a catch-all, which is a more, um, really more realistic term for who is looking for aging services. And it's not just CCRCs, it's used across used across the board. And people who have an opinion, people who have choice, people who have all their own means to purchase things, purchase services, uh, purchase supports, purchase housing. So it's it's looking it's be it's moving away from sort of a being a sort of a maternal or paternal model of we're gonna provide the care for you and you will need to come to us to we're going to provide a, a service or a product that is appealing to people, that people will want to purchase because people now have choice. They're making educated choices as to what the services and supports they need are and what they want, want them to be. So I think that's why they've moved to the word consumers. Now in Connecticut, we've talked a lot about having a resident on the board and whether that should be mandated. The majority of our CCRCs at least have at least one resident representative on the board. Um, our position has been that we would not object to that legislation as long as it was flexible. So it didn't say there has to be one resident voted on by this person or that person, that people who have current models of having resident representation could keep that model. Um, some people have three, up to three residents on their board. Some are nominated by the residents, some are nominated by the board. We do under, believe and understand that um, fiduciary responsibility and that there is a conflict of interest for everyone on the board. I mean, every, if, and if you sit on any board, you have to state what your conflict is sitting on that board. You may be the medical director of the community. You have some conflicts is when they're going to talk about medical policies. Um, so that's not, the, that's not the objection, the conflict. The objection would just be that we would want it, we would want each individual community to maintain or to adopt the model that works best for their community. For instance, we also have a covenant village model in our state. They have a national representative that alternates between, you know, between um, states and communities, and that's where a lot of their major policy is made. And so um, that has always been been, the, been our our concern. But then, how do you fit that into the forefront model? Because they don't have a board. So do you really need a strong resident association and representation of associations that can speak to management? And do you get to it from that perspective in the law? You know, so. 
trying to look at it from a broader perspective so that all communities will get the advantage of whatever you're mandating and requiring. Quick question. Who chairs the advisory committee? Actually, I was chosen to be the chair. <laughs> um, I think because, um, but it's not mandated in statute. They just, I think technically, the person who is the overseer of the, cha of the committee is the commissioner of the Department of Social Services. I chair the meetings. Um, I keep the minutes, keep the records, make the notices, that type of thing. But it could be, we could change that at any time. That wasn't mandated, that was just a choice of the committee. As far as potential name change for CCRC, how do the national offices adjust going from ASA to leading age? Very interesting question. <laughs> Because as you all know, we all went through this major name change a couple of years ago. And people, you know, it was, it was received sort of all over the spectrum. Some people loved it, some people hated it. It actually has really, actually I think we are sort of very much in the leading age groove right now. It didn't take too long at all for us to get into that groove. One thing it did do for us, really made us a stronger co-branding with the states. So that before there was, you know, there was CANFA and ASA and, you know, agency services. I thought services ASA California. was more descriptive of what you were doing. It is. I think it is, but I think what we wanted to say, and I think a little bit of what I, I'm talking about in changing our laws in Connecticut is this market, this idea, this concept of aging services is changing rapidly. And so they tried to get a name that was more encompassing of everything we could be, not just what we are. And, and, I, think, and I think also part of what Lee, Larry Minnix's vision was is that also encompassing of the people who are using our services. Because I think Larry Minnix's model of what leading age is and can be is much more inclusive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and not us and them. So that's why I think they went for this rebranding to the why was it kind of the hard hard of expanding the world of possibilities? Exactly. Exactly. I always explain to the people that I'm talking to <clears throat> that Leading Age changed its name when it became international. We now have international vendors who have booths at the uh, uh, Leading Age convention. And we actually have an international sort of branch. And they're at, when you know they're still called IASA, <laughs> but it's an international association of, of um, nations that are. You know. So we could be participating in codgers. Just a comment on the consumer word. I don't think that recognizes the huge investments that our CTR residents are making. Some of us have put off almost all our money. Yeah. And that's a very different thing than buying toothpaste as a consumer. You know, I will bring that comment back because it's true. And you know, we always, when we meet in our in Connecticut, we're, we're always brought back to the concept that this is an investment. And you need, you know, this is a true investment of, of resources that are being made on the part of the resident. And that's what makes the CCRC so distinct. I will bring that comment back to, to Larry Minix. And the other point is when our bill passed recently in Massachusetts, it applies to CCRC. Within months, our management was telling us we're not a CCRC. The state has us on all the lists. The state says we qualify by their definition, and but they say we're not a CCRC. CCRC. To so avoid the law. The definition that, you know, that covers the variety, someone said here, and maybe it was you, but CCRCs are, are very different now. There's a lot of different and I don't understand what A, B, and C are. So what, uh, Those are the different contracts, whether you're getting life care or whatever. Well, the lawyer explains that to me. We'll get a call. <laughs> We are stakeholders right. as much as the providers. It's our money. We we bought into it. Uh, I served on nonprofit uh, boards, not not continuing care boards, working with the homeless for uh, affordable housing, and we had to have a 
stakeholders, all stakeholders on our boards. And uh, it was kind of hard finding a homeless person who had <laughs> the ability and the time to be on a board when they're looking for a place to live. But we ended up getting former homeless people in that work. But we had to get their, their side of it. What's it like to be homeless? What's it like to live in a continuum care? If they're serving us, then we have a right to be there to see some excuse my lack of course. Mm. Uh, just a, a bit of information I'll share with you. Last Wednesday, our resident council met, and the president of our council introduced Namestorm. And it was very warmly received as an idea. And the council now is in the process of developing some competition within the community uh, mm. to answer the question. What, what can we use instead of CCR6? Oh, terrific. Yeah. Any other questions of Maggie? Yeah, Bob. <clears throat> I kind of, this lady and myself work, work very, very closely together. And I think one thing that hasn't been said that should be said, and I think Mag is one of the ones, there has been a change in the philosophy of leading aid with Larry Nennings. Larry reached out, I think you were very much a part of that on our campaign on the provider path. Larry saw the value of the two working together and it was a common problem. And I think Larry's support has been invaluable in the concept of CCRC. And why I say just kind of a little bit of humor, when we have the Connecticut night at the national meeting, this lady invites everybody from Connecticut. It doesn't make any difference whether you're a nursing home or you're a provider or a CCRC. But we all have a wonderful time. Yeah, we and I think that is part of what makes the Connecticut work. We've got a common problem. We've got a couple answers towards it. And we're working together on it. Wild Horse Saloon in Nashville, in case anybody wants to stop by. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.